If you were looking for a boat designed for short-handed racing, but one with the ability to sail fully crewed when you fancied more muscle power on board, what would you choose? A Genoa Sunfast, perhaps. There's plenty to choose from, and they're regularly hauling in the silverware. Or perhaps you'd go for a JPK. Over the last few years, they've also been a familiar sight at the top of the leaderboard offshore. Or maybe you'd opt for a J-boat. There are also plenty to choose from here, and in many ways, whether you're sailing short-handed or fully crewed, they have a track record for doing both. Or are you looking for something altogether more fruity? Something with more punch? Something that takes you to the next level of performance, but without the need to give up your day job and turn professional? If that's the case, maybe it's this, the Far X2. The pre-launch publicity for this boat seemed to whet quite a few appetites. A vital statistic suggests a boat that's going to raise the bar in the shorthanded scene by delivering more power and a spicier feel. And yet, at 30 foot overall, she's smaller than many of her competitors. Leaving the key question, what makes the Far X2 different? Boat number three has just arrived in the UK and we were the first to get aboard her. In fact, we were so keen to climb aboard that she was still being commissioned so there are a number of items that were still being figured out. Nevertheless, given the amount of attention that this boat has received already, we thought we should take a first look at what makes the Far X2 tick. But we were also acutely aware that this is a boat that has been newsworthy for all the wrong reasons too. Her early trials in Australia turned into a genuine nightmare after losing her keel offshore. Fortunately, her crew were rescued but it was a frightening affair for all. As many of you may know, this has been a subject that I've reported on for many years and take very seriously indeed. With so much comment and speculation since the accident, it was important to see this boat in the flesh and ask some direct questions. More of that later. But for now, what's the X2 really like? She certainly looks the part, and under sail, she's an easy boat to get on with. In 15 to 20 knots of breeze, she's sliced up wind, cracked off a few degrees, and she strains at the leash. With the A2 set, she's eager to please. And with the code zero, you experience a set of gears you might not have expected. But old boat testers' habits die hard, and what I wanted to know to start with was where the X2 is pitched in such a busy competitive market. Project manager Brett Perry was the man to ask. Well, the X2's come up uh, from, let's say, the past sort of seven or maybe even eight years of my time in, in the mini fleet. I'd spent a lot of time in, in Spain, France, uh, not have, didn't actually do the mini transit, but was a part of another project. So I sort of got my feet, if you like, in the, in the double-handed and, and solo sailing scene. Um, what I wanted to do, or the vision of the X2, is based on making a boat that is, it's, it's a, it's a double-handed boat at heart because it's very easy to sail a double-handed boat with crew but not so hard, not so easy the other way around so a crewed boat it's quite difficult to sail double-handed so a lot of the boats that are on the market you know tend to have more of the focus on you know being a crewed boat that people will just sail double-handed this boat is 100% thoroughbred one uh, double-handed um, and that's kind of where it came from it's easy to be impressed with the performance of this boat she gets up and goes at the slightest provocation but the reality is that the acid test will be on the race course, and for that, we'll have to wait. But what is clear is that the X2's layout makes it a very easy boat to handle, whether you're two up or fully crewed. And according to Brett, that was no accident. Britton Ward from Far Yacht Design and I spent hours and hours talking about what is a problem with boats. And moving around the boat is always a problem. Um, so we wanted to make sure that things like the you know, the winches were in a standard primary position, but close, close to the helmsman. I'm in the helmsman position here. I can run my windward, uh, uh, my jib sheet up to the windward side here, and I can operate everything from here. But on the other hand, you can still sail it in a crude mode. So I can be steering and you can have a person trimming to leeward, doing the normal sailing way, and that's just how we did it. It's a good job that the X2 is easy to manage because she's got plenty of sail area. I mean, basically what I wanted to do uh, from day one was uh, to have a boat that was uh, very easily 
um, reaching its numbers in lighter air. Um, now, you know, if we look at races all around the world, majority of them, you know, on average are generally under 15 knots. Yeah, you have your days where it's 20, 25, maybe, maybe more. Um, but a lot of the races are under that 15 knots, and I think that that's something that, um, that we aimed for. A boat that sails well in heavy conditions with the right sails uh, configuration, but also is up to numbers early. So, you know, seven knots, of boat, seven knots of wind, eight knots of wind, the boat is fully powered up upwind. Um, we've got a big, I call it a Comanche style of rig setup. We've got a, a rig well aft in the boat. We've got a long boom all the way to the back of the boat and a big, a big J. So it has got a lot of sail area. So when you look at the boat off the water, you know, uh, it it's, it's looks all sail. And, uh, and it feels like it when you're sailing and, and you experience that today. In addition to straight line performance, overall handling was also an important factor in the design of the sail plan and wardrobe. I guess one of the things I really learned when I was doing my solo and uh, shorthanded sailing in the minis was I, you feel a lot more comfortable when you've got more control. Um, in those boats, uh, you know, you, you're pushing hard, um, but in this boat you're a little bit bigger, you're a little bit more powerful. So if you can get yourself into a, you know, an A5 top-down furling configuration with a reef or two, uh, with a staysail, you know, you know, if you do have an issue, you're just feeling. You're not throwing a spinnaker in the water, and you, you generally can get yourself out of trouble relatively quickly. Um, same with, uh, you know, the, the weight of the boat being two th only 2,600 kilos, you're easily powered up, so you are able to be fast when it's light, and then you can still be fast when it's heavier because it's, uh, you know, you can shorten the sail. It just gives you that option. Um, you know, having to fly that big A2 and you experience it today in 20 knots is a handful and it's focused and it's hard work so I guess getting into those sort of sail configurations early just gives you a bit of peace of mind. Well, that was a very interesting day. We had about, well, just getting on for five hours of sailing out there. We had every point to sail. We had kite, the kites up, the code zero up. We had plenty of upwind, downwind, and we had a variety of breeze because it started off quite punchy and then dropped off towards the end of the day. So it was a great first test for this boat. And she's certainly, the one thing you come away thinking is she certainly punches above her weight. This is a boat that is just 30 foot long and yet downwind in particular, her performance really lights up. So in the competitive and, and ever crowded market of the shorthand sailing scene, this is going to be one boat to watch for, that's for sure. What do I like about her in particular? I think what's really impressed me, apart from just the performance of the boat, is the ease of which you can handle this boat short-handed but not just that the fact that when you have four people on the boat it's still not crowded and you can still sail it just as you would a fully crewed boat that's not as easy to achieve as you might think and they've definitely done it on this boat it's subtly very clever the layout of this boat i like it a lot they freely admit there's plenty more to be done not least of all some rope bags and a whole load of other little fiddles and tweaks that they need to do but I think the Far X2 has got the makings of being a very, very interesting boat, particularly in the shorthanded scene, but also in this emerging new market where four is fully crewed. But I still had a few more questions. Sea Ventures' Nigel Colley already sails the Genoa Sunfast range. Why would he want to take on another 30-footer? Well, it's like the, the bigger we make the pond, the more fish can swim in it. And that's really where we're at. So the, the double-handed scene has grown exponentially over the last few years, and it's opening up opportunities for new space within that scene. And this boat perfectly fills a space which currently exists in that market. What is that space then? It's the more performance end of the space. People coming up from high-performance dinghies will feel, feel more affinity with something like the X2. The Sunfast is more of a cruiser racer or even a racer cruiser. The Far X2 is very much a racing boat, but it fulfills all the criteria of being a viable offshore short-handed racing machine. So it's clear that there has been a lot of growth in the short-handed scene, but one of the 
criticisms that I'm beginning to hear a bit of is that people are saying, well, it's all very well, but now with boats that are only taking one or two people on board, there's no opportunity for you know, a raft of people that would mm -hmm. normally be hiking the boat. And yeah. so there are less opportunities to sail exciting boats like this. Well, no, that's totally wrong. These modern generation of boats, which have been designed to be very short-handed, lend themselves superbly well to putting on a crew of four or five people. You can have four or five people, two or three of those can be inexperienced, new people to the sport. You know you can sail the boat solo, double-handed. They've got water ballast, they've got hull shapes, which lend themselves well to short-handed racing, but they're easy to load up with crew. You go out on a Wednesday night, beer can racing, round the cans, put four or five people on board. They don't all have to be professional hotshots. So, what about the elephant in the room, the keel? We start with a statement. The loss of the keel from the far X2 Nexbo racing was a shock to all of us and is something we take very seriously. We have completed detailed reviews of the design, engineering, build and assembly of the boat, including testing of keel bolts and consultation with metallurgists. Other than ruling out a composite structural failure, it has not been possible to identify a singular cause of the keel loss. We believe the root cause must be related to either specific material issues in the components or to a combination of issues with the keel head or bolt installation that were not detected in the boat's assembly. Acting out of an abundance of caution, we have engineered a retrofit for all remaining keels that will convert them to an anchored stud arrangement with nuts and thread visible on the inside of the boat. So where have you gone from here? Well, we've taken a very strong um, uh, stance on making sure this never happens again to this boat and to, or to any boat. I think it's a, you know, we've focused on how to make this stronger and how to make this more reliable. And how does that manifest itself in the new keel? So instead of relying on a bolt down system, which is a common system in any boat, um, if you look at all these ten and socket systems, there's thousands of boats out there with that system. Um, Just before you go and describe tenon. So tenon is a is a basically a, a, a trapezoidal shape that goes up inside a female part of the boat, and um, that then uh, is locked in on and uses surface area as a as a as a as point of engineering. So basically, the bolts are really only holding vertical weight. So it pulls it up into a socket. Correct. Correct. And when the boat leans over, the surface area takes over. And that's a common way of fixing keels. It's been around for a long, long time. Um, so from that approach we've gone opposite of being bolt down. So we've actually in turn gone stud up, what we call stud up, where we have uh, inserted um, two studs into the top of the system and gone horizontally across uh, with two more studs, if you like. That actually anchors the whole thing in place. Um, and if you like, we can look at the picture. Yeah, the show, me on, show me on the drawings. So if we look at the studs here, um, the studs basically go down into the heel head. This is the keel head here. And down here you'll see two circular shapes. So if uh, you look at that, they're horizontal pins that go through. And then there is also another pin in that that locks that all into place. So we've got no way it can come out and no way it can turn. And then on top of that we have the, uh, the, the, wa the washer plate, if you like, which is not structural to the boat. All of this is re still relying on the composite of the, of the boat. And a locking mechanism at the top, which is this part here, which is the hex washers that go over the top. So there's two or three points here we're looking at. One, we're spreading the load from this anchor low anchor point through the head of the keel. We're not relying on threads of two different materials holding the thing together. Um, and at the top we have the locking mechanism which will disable any movement of the nuts at the top. So we're relying on nuts, do that up to a torque, and then lock it all in place. So there's a lot of ways. This It's a belts and braces approach. So as we can see here, this is uh, the raw um, keel head, still not obviously uh, fared, that's the, uh, that's the cast. You can see the pins, we're looking this upside down obviously, uh, the pins going in, you can see here the, uh, the horizontal pin with the uh, locking pin into it. So that's how it looks um, before it's being fair, uh, put into the composite fairing. And then this, this will then be wound up towards this this point here. Yeah, correct. That that goes up into the boat. Yeah, but there's yeah. obviously there's no composite fairing on that. That's just the that is the cast as is. Oh, I see. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is looking at it all glued in place. It's been um, it's been splayed the pin, 
um, and locking it all in place is, is done like that. And you can see now the end product. So this is now lifting the, lifting the whole keel, the pins are there, um, the washers are there, this is a test and obviously that's, uh, that's the final product if you like of the, uh, of the fairing. Okay. What are we so this at? is this is a guide system to get the pins into the uh, into the holes. So obviously it's quite intricate to put the keel in. You've got lots of different angles to work with. Um, so what this does is it helps the uh, helps everything align, if you like. So it's not so you're not so reliant on the skill of the travel lift driver or the uh, or the crane driver, whatever you're using. So this will actually help you guide the uh, pins into the boat. And this is so here we're looking at the uh, the pins. As they've come up, the, the, as they've come up into the into the boat, we're looking at the, the composite fairing there of the boat, and this is before the, uh, the the washer plates go on. Overall, she's a very interesting new boat, and one that taps into not just the current trend for short-handed offshore racing, but also into the new style of fully crewed racing, where four or five is a full set. But I think there's another interesting consideration, especially for those thinking of stepping into this scene. The Sunfast 3300 looks likely to be a close competitor for the FAR and for anyone trying to make up their mind between the two, they'll discover that there's very little to separate them on price. Instead, it'll all come down to how lively you want your ride to be. To find out more about the details that caught my eye on deck and her innovative layout down below, follow the link above or in the description on YouTube or simply head to the Boats Kit and Comments section on the channel.